Hi, everybody. Looks like we have a lot of you joining us today um, to learn more about harvesting hemp um, from industry expert Corbett Hefner. Um, my name is Jen Paffenroth. I am the business support manager at IEC Thermo, and I'm really glad you can join us today. Um, I know you will learn a lot of valuable information um, from both Corbett and Shauna about harvesting, but before we dive in, I have a few very quick announcements. Um, this is already our sixth webinar, so if this is your first time tuning in, be sure to check out all of our other webinars on our YouTube channel, IEC Thermo. We have a wide range of topics ranging from hemp drying basics to a panel of hemp farmers who share what they learned last year. Lots of valuable information and I think you would find it really helpful. Um, second, we want to answer your questions specifically about hemp drying or IEC Thermo's high efficiency multi-phase hemp dryers. So we are gonna be doing a live Q&A webinar in a couple weeks where we'll have a panel of IEC Thermo team members answering your questions. So send any related questions to me at genp at iecompanies.com and we will be sure to get them answered in that webinar. Um, and finally, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar um, about harvesting, drop them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we will answer as many of them as possible at the end of the webinar. We're gonna try to stick right to an hour, so um, if, you don't, if we don't get to your question, we'll you know, shoot us an email, we have our contact info up here, and we'll, we'll get it answered one way or another. Um, so on that note, let's get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Shauna and Corbett. Hi everybody, um, my name's Shauna. You've seen me before on a couple of webinars or potentially at some trade shows. Um, I'm the National Contracts Manager and the Business Development Manager for IEC Thermo. We're really excited to have Corbett here today. Um, he's certainly an industry expert. He's been all over the world harvesting, harvesting hemp. Um, so he is certainly the perfect person to speak about harvesting. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Corbett, what does your company do? Can you tell us a little bit more about Formation sure. Ag? Um, what is your role specifically and what services do you offer your customers? Um, Formation Ag, we, we engineer design, develop, and engineer hemp harvesting and up to extraction processing equipment. So we've got multiple different types of harvesting equipment, depending on how you want to farm. And, and uh, seed and flower separation, flower and stem separation equipment, um, uh, um, a whole myriad of products to help you get your, your crop ready for uh, extraction and get it to marketable. We also handle, um, we, we also design and build the corticators. Uh, U.S. made uh, roller breaker style uh, machines. We have the fiber track 660 and then a bigger machine called the Genesis. It's higher throughput and will comb and card your material. Uh, my role here is, is R&D, Vice President of R&D and Business Development. Uh, but we do all chip in and do a little bit of everything. And I also do a lot of sales. Um, <clears throat> but that's in general kind of what we do here for the moment. And we keep adding things. We've got cultivation equipment as well. I forgot about that. So if you want to, you know, learn how to knock weeds out without using a bunch of herbicides, and, uh, then we can help you either robotic weeding or precision in row weeding, inner row weeding, excuse me. So. Awesome. Thank does you. that help? Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us some um, just hemp harvesting basics and what role Bad. does harvesting play in the overall supply chain? Boy, the harvesting in the overall supply chain when it turn, comes to, in, in terms of, you know, your return per acre as a farm, it's, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, if you damage and rupture the trichomes, if you're an oil producer, then you drastically can reduce. And we've got a slide here coming up that'll show you kind of a gross return per acre and what that harvest choice means to you as, in terms of return back to your farm. Um, harvesting basics, know where you're going with this stuff. We like to tell people if you don't have a home, if you, everything starts with a sale and works backwards, have your product sellable. Uh, since there's no granary type model for this where you take it somewhere and sell it, you have to be planning ahead. I mean, if you haven't planned for harvesting yet, you're, you're running out of time. We need to know from you quick. Um, harvesting basics, if you're, if you're a cannab cannabinoid farmer, <clears throat> you know, if you're trying to grow oil crops, CBD, CBG, whatever the newest one is, you got to understand what the goal is. 
And in this instance, you're trying to harvest a trichome that's grown on the end of a little tiny stalk and it, it presents itself in a drop of oil. If you break that drop of oil open and rupture it, it starts to oxidize and evaporate right away. So your, op, your, your chance of getting full spectrum oil goes down as soon as you rupture that trichome. So you want to be very aware of that. That's why we don't like combining and chopping these crops because it really can hurt your yield in terms of revenue per acre. So <clears throat> that's kind of the gist of those of that. If you're a farm, if you're now getting into grain and fiber, uh, basics for fiber is we try to get people not to rotary mow uh, the crop because every time a blade impacts a fiber strand, that can uh, make a damage in that piece of strand of fiber. So we try to swath these things with sickle type mowers, put them down, let them rat, flip it over, let it red again, then round bale it. Uh, round baling at the moment seems to be the easiest way to move the crop. Um, and we're making machinery to unroll these bales and run them into our fiber processing equipment. So we're building fiber processing equipment modular. So you can have a bale unwind, decorticator, um, herd cleaning section, uh, we're working on some combing carding and carding equipment too with the with the ultimate goal of having the decortication feed into a cotton gin um, just above the uh, lint cleaning stage so that somebody does not have to go out and buy these multi-million dollar facilities uh, to get into hemp textiles we just don't see the the roi on this massive in, uh, investment in decorticating plants when there's a lot of existing capital equipment sitting out there that can be used so we're trying to develop these machines with that goal in mind so we can reduce the uh, capital outlay and give this industry a huge boost. Um, so I think that answers that part pretty decent. I love how you talked about working backwards. You know, we've touched on that on a couple different webinars before. And I love that you reiterated it, you know, really starting with your end product, who are you selling it to? And then working mm -hmm. backwards seems to kind of eliminate some of the, the trickiness a little further on. Would oh, you yeah. say people oversimplify harvesting? Like they don't think it's as big of a project as it is? Do you think that people think it's a little bit easier than it is? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, there's, I like to tell people, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> you can go through and silage chop one of these crops and and we're seeing at least in the test data we have when we send all this stuff out and get it verified we see between 50 and 90 percent loss in the trichome yield so <clears throat> just because you can chop it doesn't mean you should you know we we did it wrong the first two years that we harvested too the first machines we built the first grasshopper uh, went behind the combine and we threshed it and lost 90 percent of the crop so that was the impetus of the clean cut machine which is a whole plant harvester um, it, which works great if you're going to you know, hang dry or if you have another drying method like a grain bin drying floors. Um, it, 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 it's, you know, a whole plant. So if you've got an eight foot tall plant, that's what you've got. And then we came out with the clean strip last year, which strips the buds off of the stock, which that can be fed into y'all's machinery. Um, and it dries much faster because the stock is what takes so long to dry. I don't know if most people realize that. The stock is what takes it is consumes all the energy and time in drying. The buds will dry themselves very fast, uh, but it's that stem piece that takes forever to dry. And that's why we also make flower stem separation equipment to help drying and, and eliminate that hand shucking and bucking. Um, with large scale agriculture, we load these things with big front end loaders and you know run tons of material an hour through pulling flour. And in this instance, a lot of places now get pollinated. So we have seed and flour in there. So we can separate flower and stem, and then we can separate the seed from the flower prior to extraction. So the extractor is getting just the flower, no stock, no seed, which helps them in their throughput. You know, that's, that's what's gonna make everything work here is if everybody's efficient, especially at today's price points. I mean, in this spreadsheet, I think uh, the median price right now is 77 cents per point per pound for CBD. And you can still make money at that if you farm it smart and you're efficient and you try to reduce labor and you drastically reduce your input cost. And we, we help people all the time with that because we want farmers to succeed. Without these family farms going, none of us are gonna be very happy. So we really try to help these farmers succeed. We want the farmers to make money. Exactly, we agree at IEC as well. You know, if our farmers aren't successful, we're not successful. Our success mm -hmm. is very much tied um, to that <clears throat> supply chain and to each other. Um, something that you had touched on was that 
you know, you went down one road with a design and you kind of backed up a little bit knowing, hey, this isn't really going to work. Um, so what were some of the main challenges that you saw last year regarding harvest and what are some of the more common mistakes that you're seeing being made um, during the harvest season? Oh, man. <laughs> Probably the most prevalent one is calling two days before harvest and not having a harvest plan. That, that seemed to be the worst one. Um, you know, you, people think you can just drive into this crop with a normal draper head on a combine and you make it about 20 yards and it plugs up. Combines are not meant to handle two inch diameter stocks that are at 60, 70, 80% moisture. That's just not what they were built for. Um, you know, people are modifying some of the old ones, but they still thresh it. Uh, other challenges, <clears throat> you know, is, is hemp went from 75,000 acres in 2018 to 511 last year. We ran into genetics that we had never seen. Uh, we had never harvested crop that was a complete sphere and had heavy branching and didn't collapse. We'd cut eight foot, nine foot tall hemp plants, lay them down on the draper belt, and they go down to about 18 inches, and go up the machine and into the trucks, and away you go. These ones were like a globe, and they just rolled everywhere. That was a <laughs> challenge. Uh, a lot of people we ran into had very, very tall beds. Uh, we'd like to see the flatter the bed, the better, especially if you select a genetic that has lower main branching that comes out and droops down. And, you know, if you're on a 12 inch tall bed, we can't go down there and pick those up. There's not a machine. At that time, there wasn't a machine to do that. We've got another product there's a picture of here later called the Super Clean Cut uh, that we're making with Bish Enterprises uh, to go down and pick up those branches. So that, that was some challenges. Um, early frost. Uh, drying the crop out. People really freaked out this year with the snow and these early frost. You just don't need to panic. It doesn't hurt it that bad. Snow hurts a crop if you cut it and lay it on the ground and it gets wet and you can't pick it up, then it's a problem. Hemp, if you leave it standing, can handle some cold. It can handle snow, but not if it's on the ground. Uh, I've got some pictures. I just went out and walked the field this morning of a complete volunteer CBD field that when I took the first picture a month ago had frost damage because it was seven degrees and went out two weeks later it had grown out of that frost damage and I'll, I'll post this on LinkedIn I pulled one plant out it was six seven inches tall and overall it was 17 inches to the bottom of the taproot it overwintered it was deep tilled disc and cultipack and that crop came back and it looks like a beautiful green carpet this is the most hardy plant it's amazing to me. Very resilient. Yeah. Absolutely. Very. I've seen that as well. So. Um, you touched on it a little bit. So 2019 was a very, very CBD focused, almost tunnel vision. Um, mm -hmm. Are you seeing an increase in um, the interest in other parts of the plant, whether that's, you know, the fiber, the herd, the seed? Um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of whole plant utilization? We have, you know, our, our inquiries into our website. We have to a day, 180 degree switch from CBD harvesting and production to fiber and grain. It's amazing, it just completely switched. So we're talking to people more about CBD or about grain, either grain and fiber or grain alone, or you know we've got equipment where we can harvest seed, flour, and the fiber in one pass now. So we've, we've had those conversations and then a lot of talk about cortication, um, we want people, again, start with the sale and work backwards. Don't plant more than you can risk plowing under because you can still lose money if you're not smart about this thing. Really do your homework. Uh, you have to educate yourself heavily in this. Call people like us and, uh, you know, we can help you to learn about this fast um, because you can get, you know, over your head. It, it, it was easy to overproduce CBD. Fiber will be even easier to overproduce because uh, you can plant it with your grain equipment. So we, we want to caution people that it's not the endless sea yet. It's coming, but it takes diligence and some entrepreneurs to drive this forward. Uh, we're going to start decorticating for some people here on large scale with our, our equipment that we have in house here, just to start goosing this thing forward because it's kind of, it's not moving very fast. And we'd just like to see it faster because we need that. We need consumption. So we have to help build demand. So Absolutely. yeah, it was a complete switch. What do you think caused that? Was it just the oversupply and the lack of demand driving the price point down? Or is it people becoming more educated with the different applications <coughs> of the plan? What do you think caused that day shift? Overproduction. 
the price dropping down, people had spent, you know, tens to $15,000 an acre to grow a crop and the return was not there. It was down in the eight and $9,000 range. At that point in time, it's come down even more now. Um, I saw, I actually saw the price go up a little bit last week. So that was kind of encouraging. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was the thing oversupply. And then a lot of it was people didn't plan to dry, ran out of room. Uh, they don't understand the scale and scope that it takes to harvest and, and hold an acre of a, of a hemp plant. Uh, you know, it takes 18,000 cubic feet if you've got it stored, you know, flat on the floor. If you're hang drying, you need 44,000 cubic feet to store it. And then once you buck it, what are you gonna do with all those super sacks if, you're, if your extractor says, ah, I can't take it till July? What are you gonna do with it? So, and it, to tie that in, a lot of the crop that got harvested got scrapped because it molded, because they weren't ready for those things. So now you've got an over inventory, you've got a poor quality thing, and it just kind of all rolled into one spot and you had, a, you had a big mess, you had a collapse, but it's going to come back. And then the virus situation didn't help much either, did it? <laughs> no, it did not. You are certainly preaching to the choir about, you know, people not really thinking that through last year. I got a ton of phone calls. You know, I've got 400 acres that need to be harvested right now. Help me find a dryer. Well, buddy, like my hands are tied a little bit. There's only so much we can do. So really, really bringing it back to that working backwards, starting at the end and filling in the details um, really before you get started. Planning, planning, planning. Planning, planning it's exactly. It's not We're like starting. the normal grain crop. You can't put it in the ground and you just have infrastructure. It does not exist today. It's Still coming. there, right? Thanks to people like you, but not it's there coming. just Yep. So here we have a slide of some trichomes and hemp. Did you want to talk a little bit more about this? You had mentioned sure. that oil droplet on the top of the shaft and how very delicate they are. Yeah, I, I love this, this slide I put together here. And on the left-hand side is just a bud in a field here in Colorado I took a year or two ago. And you can see those trichomes on the bud. You know, the trichomes are born, grown on the outside of the calyx, the seed husk, and then on the sugar leaves, the little small leaves right around the bud, okay? There's no husk, there's no coat on those trichomes. So that lower image in the right hand side, that's a microscopic view dyed. Of course, you can see the stalk, you can see the oil uh, sac on top of there and then the gland that secrete the oil is inside of that. So that's why we, we've chosen the techniques that we have and this, this picture drives our engineering. How can we harvest this crop and not break those apart before it's dried? And we get going through here a little more, we'll show you pictures of post drying where we've successfully done that. We've got third party test data from our farmers confirming that this is working too. So we, we're happy to show that. I show it at every show we go to. It's in my presentations too sometimes, just to show that, because that, that's the trick. How do you keep that thing from getting broken when you're in the oil farming? Same thing with grain. It's a really soft uh, seed coat and it's incredibly prone to shatter. So how can you harvest that selectively and not lose 50% of your crop in the ground to shattering? We're working on that too. So, you know, we, we built the super, uh, the, the clean strip machine to remove these buds, but we're also working on that machine uh, for seed harvesting. We think we can harvest seed and flower with the grasshopper cart behind this, the clean strip machine because it creates a pretty massive vacuum and we can collect all that. We harvested a crop a couple of weeks ago that was very, very dry no dust coming out of the head and seeds coming into the harvester. So it's, it's a viable technique. Fantastic. I was at a show and you were speaking and you had something that really resonated with me. If you're in this space specifically for cannabinoids or CBDs, you're not growing big, beautiful plants. You're growing little tiny pieces of oil. People mm -hmm. kind of get disillusioned. You know, that's your goal. And what you're doing is saving those little teeny tiny, they look like little snail eyeballs to me. Mm -hmm. That's what you're growing. That's what you're saving for. Um, you know, people yep. call it dust. People call it keef. That's concentrated cannabinoids. That's what you're going yep. for. So that's very smooth. deliberate in all of your processes, knowing... <clears throat> what you're going for. Yep, this is the focus right here, those little purple dots, even though they're not purple in real life. <laughs> they're clear if you did your job right. Exactly right, turn it amber. So yeah, that, that understanding what you're doing, how you're farming it, and what your goals are, you really got to understand that. Very deliberate, so, right? Mm-hmm. 
So what are some of the best ways that you have seen to harvest for CBD biomass, smokable flour, um, <laughs> or fiber? And then what are some tricks for harvesting overly wet material? So stuff that's, we call it seaweed, like 80%, 85%. Um, just overly wet. How do you harvest something like that? No problem. Biomass in general, flower material, you know, if, if your drying technique is and, and your goals are to harvest uh, whole plants and, you know, that, that more niche uh, high-end market and you want to hang the dry and cure, then our, you know, our clean cut, the whole plant harvesting systems work really well. Smokable flower, the people that I've talked to that are doing the higher end stuff are still pulling it by hand because it's handled more like normal cannabis. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's dried and trimmed and inhaled, had really kid gloved. Um, we've actually, some of the buds coming out of the clean strip, I've had, you know, and I don't know much about smokable, so don't take this for gospel. I've had people say that those are probably good enough that you could sell them for smokable. Um, I don't completely understand the smokable market because you buy a bud and then you grind it up and put it in paper and smoke it. So, you know, what's it matter if we harvest with a machine or by hand? Fiber, um, we'd like to caution people, especially if you're actually trying to make a fiber, if you're going to do textiles, yard goods, cordage, etc. We prefer not to see hay binds or rotary mowers go through and, and hit the crop to cut it. It'll cut it. Again, just because it will doesn't mean you should. If, if you have a hay bind head that's spinning, uh, those, those, the ends of those are spinning somewhere around 300 miles an hour. And when you're going through that crop and the stalk is standing there, the blade comes through and hits that thing every two or three inches. And every impact is now a damage to that, the tensile strength of that fiber. And you can see that when we decorticate those and you pull on a fiber strand where it breaks, it'll break at a 90 degree angle. And that tells you it was impacted by something. A natural break in a fiber fibrillates, so it's rough. Mm -hmm. So we would prefer to see people sickle cut that and then lay it down for redding. Redding is, is the bacterial action that breaks the lignans down that bind the fiber to the herd and then flip it because fiber will rat on one side. And then you can come through and rake it and round bale it. You can round bale because we're, we're taking the, the easy route because we can unroll those better and feed them into our decorticators. So we actually have working piece of machinery doing that. And then, you know, the overly wet stuff, if it's whole plant, we can handle it. You know, our, our machines, the, the gauge of the sickles are two and three eighths inches in diameter at four to six miles an hour. I've seen them go through much thicker stalks than that. It's amazing. The knife hits it and splits it in four pieces and then it goes through the cutter. But we published two and three eighths. Uh, the clean strip, I have not seen it have any issues with wet product at all because it's leaving the fiber. Then it makes your life as a drying company easier because we've got all that fiber gone for you. And then we're making some gentle threshing machinery to break those buds down if there's seed in it or if you need it broken down a little more to go to extraction. You gotta remember inside that bud is another little, looks almost like coral, uh, piece of stock. So once we break those down, we can actually separate that too with our screen cleaning machinery. Nice. Okay, so we try to get most of that out because as an extractor, you really don't want that stuff in there because it's just extra material you have to process that doesn't yield as much oil. Remember, CBD is percent by weight. So anything we can do to take weight out of that, your concentration goes up. You know, we've cleaned crops that people thought were, well, they were 12% when they harvested, 14%. They combined it. Uh, when it came to us to run it across the screen cleaner, it was two, and we turned it into four. Because, again, it's percent by weight. So we removed those little quarter-inch pieces of stock, half-inch pieces of stock, and we doubled the cannabinoid. I've seen it go higher than that, but... We don't talk about that much because that was pretty impressive. <laughs> Results not typical. <laughs> yes, some assembly required. Something like that. <laughs> Perfect. This is one of those screen cleaners that if I can't tell if it's playing real smooth, that the right hand side is the material that would be ready for extraction. What you're seeing right there are those little quarter inch pieces of stem coming out. Uh, there might be some bud pieces in there and then you can rerun that and get all that out. And then the extreme left-hand side is large pieces of stock, two inch, three inch pieces of stock. But this close up right here is the flower that if it had seed in it, we would run it through our seed cleaners. And if it does not, then it would go straight for extraction. And that's eighth inch, quarter inch pieces coming out of that. Remember this is sitting on a pallet, you know, you'd have a conveyor there or something, but we're just running this in the shop. Then you can see in those three tubs, the three different sizes. So it has three streams coming out. 
and then it has vacuum system on top. If you have a vacuum, we can draw that key out if it's creating a lot of dust. It definitely seems like a pretty simple process, but definitely don't undervalue something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it means it's, it's a value added step. The more clean you can get your product before you take it to extraction, the more money you're gonna get for it, for not a huge investment. And that machine's not unique to hemp. You can clean everything from grass seed to sunflowers. To, I got a guy sending me hazelnuts to run across one of those. So it's a very versatile piece of equipment, grain, barley, organic crops, you name it, you, you can reconfigure that pretty quickly and run it. You're talking 20 minutes, you can reconfigure and run barley through that same machine. Fantastic. This is uh, this little short video is a clean cut running in a probably 12 to 15 foot tall crop in Europe. Uh, here they're, they're cutting the tops off, that's gonna be their CBD. And that it doesn't look like it from the video, but that's an 8R John Deere tractor, and that thing's running at the head height of the operator, so that's nine and some change feet off the ground. Very gentle, very fast. Uh, in this instance, they're, they're roller crimping the fiber. They don't think they use the fiber, but this was in Europe, so we've got one running over there. And then uh, you see some more video in here of, of those machines running. I just put in some short ones, so you can see very gentle. None of those bud, uh, buds are chopped or broken down. The, this one gets dried and then they're bucking it, uh, taking the buds off of it, but there's one technique for you. Very interesting. I like how, like you said, gentle. It's almost just like a comb, combing through the field. Um, very gentle. Yep. yep, that's the objective of that one. <laughs> this guy is, this is a clean strip machine running in, I think this was Northern California, Southern, Southern Oregon. Those are four or five foot plants over plastic. I think those are 60 inch rows. And if it's playing right, you'll see, see where the two rows are between under the boom and the cart. That was the last pass harvested and it's pretty darn clean. So there's all your stock staying in the field and we're pulling all those buds off and those go to the drying technique, right? That saves here, at least the, the farms that we have here that did hand stripping, and even some of those smaller bucker machines, so this saves them between four and five thousand dollars an acre in labor cost to do that bucking strip. So here, larger scale farms here, there are two people in the field. I mean, these two guys are just walking around. There's really just the operator and the guy running the pacing truck, and that's your harvest and your bucking crew. So you went from 50, 60 people to two <laughs> in a machine that you know, it just runs. We had very good luck with these. We had several of them in the field. And I, I, I didn't even add up how many thousands of acres got pulled with these this year, but it was a bunch. Actually, some of them are still this running. Piece of equipment specifically because on the drying side, you know, fiber is the biggest deal or the biggest issue that we deal with. And a piece of equipment like this just completely eliminates that from the, from the mm -hmm. equation. By leaving it in the field, you know, that improves your dryer performance, it improves your drying capacity, and it leaves the integrity of you know, your stocks and stems in the field. That way you're not shopping them if you wanted to come yep. back through. Um, technically that still has the integrity intact. Is that right? <clears throat> right. Yeah, those buds are still whole. They, there's a picture here coming up. You'll see the whole buds. Um, this machine, the, the way you see it in this picture, is configured with an offload boom. We can also hook this up to our grasshopper or our big vacuum carts or trailers and, and draw these back in with a vacuum. That Again, the vacuum does not impact anything. We never impact this crop. Um, th that, that piece of machinery excels as the season gets later and your crop gets drier. The drier gets, the more it wants to shatter and the easier it is to break down. So that's where, you know, the, vers the boom versus a grasshopper cart would be something different. I think we got a little short clip of a grasshopper running next. And you said you have one that has a vacuum. Is that for mm -hmm. keef capture? Yeah, for the keef or seed. We've used or it to seed. pull the, the flower and the seed off. And buds, whole buds, we've used it that way too. Fantastic. So we keep learning. It's not perfect yet, but we're making very, very good strides. Uh, this is that same machine running in a little different field, uh, running real low. I hope that video is playing nice and smooth because this thing's just flying. This is, I, I love this video. This is a very, <laughs> that's a good one. I'll play it again because I like it so much. Mm-hmm. I guess if people replay the meeting, maybe it'll be smoother. On mine, it's, it's choppy, but you get the gist of it, I hope. 
And what's the next one here? We'll watch it one more time just in case because it's a good one. So he's pacing this with a little trailer. These are real small stature plants, but see how dry they are? Mm -hmm. This would be an instance where the grasshopper might help you collect some more of that, but it must be just wet enough. There's no dust coming out of the front of this machine. That actually, the machine by itself creates a little bit of a vacuum. So, but that's not a normal, we build those in partnership with Shelburne Reynolds. Uh, we have them set those up to our specifications with different fingers, uh, right hand discharge, and then that boom. So it's very, very gentle on the crop. Awesome. All right, well, we did a little bit of looking backwards. Now let's look ahead. So what are some of the changes you're expecting to see um, this year? And do you have any new equipment coming out? You've touched on a couple of them, but. Yep, we do. Um, Big changes for this year is probably a pretty substantial reduction in acreage over last year. I don't know if this is a trend or not, but in our area, we're probably at between 10 and 30% of the acreage here than uh, 2019 going in the ground for CBD. Uh, fiber has increased a ton. There's a lot of people that are doing grain for dehulling and cold pressing. Uh, so we see a shift in the, in the products that are being planted and definitely a downshift in CBD. Um, different farming techniques, you know, the guys that have been farming here, uh, CBD that is, uh, do not plant on large row spacings. They plant on six inch rows with a genetic that's a mid-level, you know, I call it mid-level six to eight to nine percent CBD content. And people say, oh no, you can't do that. Well, remember CBD is percent by weight. So when we remove the stock that can come up, but the big thing is their input costs are less than a few thousand dollars an acre, less than 2,000 bucks versus somebody growing horticulturally that can be between 10 and $20,000 an acre. So that's not a financially viable model versus doing it this other way with lower genetics, no roguing, no weeding, because the hemp plant, as soon as it canopies, if you've managed your, your tillage right and your weed pressure is, is low when you plant, the hemp will beat the weeds out. And as soon as they canopy, if you're on tighter spacing, you don't have weed pressure. Right now, now things get civilized. Now you set yourself up for mechanical harvesting, easier mechanical drying, easier separation, massive reductions in labor, and you don't have to spend that huge amount of dollars on feminized seed that you know, I tell people you, you may as well plan ahead. At some point in time, your crop is going to get pollinated. There's feral hemp. You know, this is the seventh year in Colorado uh, going in the ground. There's feral hemp here, there's volunteer hemp. You go in Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, there's feral hemp all over the place. So you may as well be aware of that and just plan ahead. So plan for having to remove seeds at some point in time. You're gonna have a neighbor that's gonna plant a crop that's either got hermaphrodites or males and they're gonna miss them. So you may as well be aware of that. Uh, new equipment, the super clean cut. That's that machine that'll go down in the furrows and pick up the rows and do some stripping. This guy here. Uh, the seed cleaning and flower and uh, seed separation equipment. We put a few of them out there, but you know we're trying to make a push to, to let people know that that equipment is there and you don't have to panic if you get pollinated. We can get the seed out and save you. Uh, and you just don't have to worry that much about it in, in our findings. Uh, this machine really excited about. Uh, we make this on a one row machine, two row out to five and six rows. So 20 inch row spacing, 30 inch row spacing, now uh, we're debating on doing a 40 inch row space so you can do wider spacing, but um, that's kind of how it's set up. And you can see the snouts on here that lift the foliage. And then at the top of those snouts, right before it drops into our, into our uh, draper is a sickle where it will finish the cut. And then those big uh, canoe paddle looking things with the reels. So if you're growing a really tall genetic, those can reach over the top of that plant. Cause all we're trying to do is hold the plant vertical long enough to strip it and get the uh, foliage cut and drop it onto the belt. Uh, gently. And then in this image, the, the offload boom that you would put this into a truck with has been taken off because it was at a show, but it would go on there. So we're, we're engineering and building these with Bish um, uh, to help hemp farmers make some money out. And this, you know, like our one row machine, uh, it'll go on like a 30 to 40 horse tractor. So that makes it really, really viable for the small scale people because that's the kind of equipment they have. So it'll be a little cantilevered rear three point thing. Uh, that, that should help those people a ton. So we're excited to have that out. Exciting. Yeah, I believe I saw this in Texas. Is that where this picture is from, from Dallas? Yep, this was in Dallas. Perfect. Yeah, it's definitely a pretty, pretty impressive piece of equipment. Yep. 
We like it. <laughs> What's some advice you would have for somebody looking to get involved in the hemp space? Yeah, plan ahead. Plan <laughs> ahead. Sell your crop first. You know, make sure you're you're safe. Make sure you can make some money. This I like to tell people over and over again. This is a great rotation crop. You know, I, I just hate seeing people switch their entire farms over to hemp. Uh, this is a fantastic rotation. Uh, in our area, we're, we're one of the larger potato growing areas in the country. Uh, hemp, you know, we're in a high mountain desert. We're just shy of 8,000 feet elevation, and they can grow hemp on 12 to 13 inches of water. So that's a much lower water consumption plant. Um, it helps with organic fields, with weed suppression, if, if you farm it in the right practice. Uh, for potato space, they're finding amazing results in nematode suppression. Nematodes are a, a, a physical damage on a, on a table stock potato and they're seeing nematode counts of basically zero. They, and they're not sure yet why or how they're studying it. Uh, the mechanism is unknown, but it's doing it somehow. Um, it, so it's a really, really neat rotation crop. Uh, and that's what we wanna see. You know, guys that are growing corn in the Midwest, I think it's a great place to do it. It takes less water. And if you farm it correctly, the return can still be better than your grain and corn crops that are out there. You know, corn, I think uh, last I looked was trading for 313 a bushel. So you're talking on an average yield 535 bucks an acre, you know, gross return. This can still, when we get to the spreadsheet here, this thing can still make you more money than that, substantially more. So, but you gotta do your homework and plan ahead. And, you know, plan right now for 2021. Absolutely. So it's thing. never too early to start planning. Yep. I completely agree. Learn, the educate yourself. Lose, right? yep. Find good people to partner with as far as extraction and, and consumption and help educate people around you because we have to create demand for this crop so we can keep going up in acreage. That's one thing that's missing is, is the general public education. We need to keep working on that so that we get rid of the stigma that CBD is you know, a narcotic and it's not Farm Bill made it such, um, but uh, people have lost that in translation. It's unfortunate. It's a good point. Very good point. Yeah, the Farm Bill was supposed to make this a commodity. It wasn't supposed to be heavily regulated. Nice. But yeah, this is this is uh, buds that were harvested with a clean strip. The image on the left is um, a semi load of stripped buds. You just look down in there. There's not a pile of stock in that thing. The image on the right is out of this truck. So it was transported 35 minutes in the back of that truck, unloaded with a front end loader. Uh, here in Colorado, because we have potato storages, a lot of people dry in their potato storages because they have them. Uh, this bud on the, on the right was post-dried. And if you look at that close, you still see all the trichome stalks still attached. When we first pulled this out, I was absolutely amazed that that was the condition. So we've got 30 third party test results showing this pre and post harvest over a 10 day span. Uh, CBD content actually went up a little bit, went from 7.7 .7 to 8.7. So that's pretty interesting. And remember this picture when we talk about the spreadsheet here in a second, when you advance forward to that, there's two things here. The next picture is this same bud grown by the same farm across the, across the road they sold the farm or sold this crop standing and the guy came in with a combine. So that bud that in the previous slide was 8%, 8.7. This one after it was post combine came in at 1.18%. So that the disruption breaking off of the trichomes, letting those goes out of the body of the combine is a dramatic reduction in oil. People say, oh, you know, I can handle that. Not that big a deal. When we get to the next slide, I'll show you the financial recourse for that choice in harvesting and what that financial impact was uh, to, to that harvesting choice. You know, a lot of people think CBD grades over time. My theory at the moment is most of degradation you see in a CBD crop happens during harvesting and, and they just don't test it until later. Uh, here, like this farm, because we use them as our guinea pig, we go out and do these testing. So we see this data much, much faster than most people would. Uh, so we, we know what the harvesting machinery mechanism of choice does to your yield. So I just, I like to throw this picture in there to show people the difference of what happened. You know, there's a lot of stim in there. We can clean that out. I might make it to a 3% crop, but it's still, you know, you lost, well, I think that's 77% of your oil yield. So we flip to that next slide, we'll show you the choice of that, or the impact of that choice. 
So this, and, and I share this spreadsheet, if somebody ever wants it, you just let me know. Down the left-hand column is dry yield of flower per acre. So 500 pounds, 1,000, 1,500. I'm just showing a chart here, right? Across the top where it says oil percentage, I just did two, four, six, and eight. So these two green cells here, 8% is, was off of our clean strip, and we get the same results off the clean cut, you know, whole plant harvesting. So what I've done here is said, okay, at 8% and 1,000 pounds of dry flour, you have the potential for 80 pounds of oil versus 2% at 1,000 pounds dry, you've got 20 pounds of oil. So there's the weight, all right? If you go down to the next table, it says current price point. This is from Pan Exchange's um, uh, database. Uh, this was last week. Oil is trading for point, 77 cents per point per pound. So what I've done is I've taken that uh, poundage in the 8% crop, your gross revenue at 77% on 1,000 pounds dry flour was $6,160. Doesn't look too hot, but if you only grew this crop for $2,000, you're in pretty good shape. So what happens if you combine it in this instance on that crop that we showed you the picture of that was combined? I rounded it up to 2% just for fun. Now your total return is 1,540. So there's, there's your potential gross revenue. I don't go into the cost on these because every, every farm, every field can be a little different, but I'm just demonstrating what the gross revenue per acre could be and probably is, if, you know, these numbers are verifiable, so you can find this data. Um, a lot of people want to do this 50-50 crop share. So what if you only had $6,100 in, in viable returns and you split it with an extractor and you spent $10,000 an acre to grow this crop? Now you've only got $3,000 back to you. And then, you know, you see, I go out to 14% here. Let's say you had an excellent yield and you're even at 8%, you had 12,000 bucks, it's pretty darn good. Just, you know, just demonstrating because I think, you know, when we go around to these shows, you, I'm sure you get some of the same questions. That, How much can I make growing hemp? So we, <laughs> we, put, we put some of this on, on paper just to demonstrate that. So these are numbers that we have experienced. We haven't seen every cultivation practice on the earth, um, but these, these are numbers that are averages from people that we talk to around the country. And, you know, we, we've, we've got machinery all over Canada and the U.S., and we get to see a lot of different harvesting and cultivation practices. And these are pretty decent average numbers from what we've seen around the country. So we're very fortunate. Our machine has probably cut more hemp than anybody in the world, especially for CBD. I agree. I love that you quantified this because it does give people more of an idea of, you know, not, not the work involved, but what you can get out of it. Mm -hmm. which tells you how much work to put into it. You know what I mean? You don't want to spend dollars to save pennies, um, which we've seen as well, but being very deliberate and very planned. Um, you know, you, like you said, you can make money with this crop. It's mm -hmm. definitely possible, but you have to be very deliberate and very calculated. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, that kind of concludes our IEC questions. Um, if you have any questions over the course of the webinar, please go ahead and stick them in the Q&A section now. Um, and Jen's going to go through um, asking Corbett some of these questions. All right. Good. We have, best. <laughs> we have quite a few. So Corbett, thank you so much. First of all, we'll get into the first question. Um, does Formation Ag sell pulpers or something similar? for like paper pulp, uh, we will. I've actually been working on that quite heavily for, for hemp paper. We've got a customer that has a formulation for 100% hemp paper. So we've been quite diligently trying to find economically viable capital expenditures for that uh, pulping. So yeah, we will. It's not something we've you know advertised yet. It's just a, one of my R&D projects, but it's viable. I have machine made paper sitting on the shelf behind me here. 100% hemp. You see a lot of hemp paper on the internet that's 20 or 30% hemp blended into a paper wood pulp. This is 100%, which I love because it's an annually renewable pulp source instead of 30-year tree crops. Love it. And you know, you got to remember, uh, our, our, like our Fibertrack 660 machine was based on the Slickton patent design and roller breaker style hemp decorticator. And that's what started the downward uh, spiral in hemp that got hemp banned. Um, if you read the Slickton papers, he was concerned about deforestation in the early 1900s, and he built the first decorticator. We built the last one, that, or the first one that was built in the U.S. that we know of since that one, 
and that's what got him banned was uh, um, worried about paper and the big shot paper dude shut him down. So mm -hmm. pulp league is important to us. Fiber and paper. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Corbett. Very interesting. Um, moving on to the next one. What is the target moisture for fiber to process and market effectively? How is it best achieved in the Midwest where there is higher harvest humidity? It's a little trickier when you get out there. Um, you know, you, you treat it like hay. If you can put it up, if you can put your hay up at 13, 15% moisture and not have a spontaneous combustion, then, then you're in good shape. Uh, we actually had some, we live in the San Luis Valley in Colorado where it's usually in the 20% moisture range. And I don't know what happened, but we just walked outside before this podcast uh, and some of the fiber we decorticated was sitting in a pile outside and all of a sudden was smoking. Somebody got a little bit wet. This stuff does burn. Be very, very aware. Hemp fiber is flammable, people. And I've mm -hmm. seen a building that it burned down so fast and so hot, it would blow you away. So, yeah, if you can treat it like your hay, if you can get your hay put up, you can get your hemp put up. Remember, when you're drilling a true fiber crop, you're not going to take it all the way to seed. Once it, it, before it flowers, you'll cut it down. So even in the Midwest, uh, you're going to be cutting much earlier than in the fall when, you know, when, it, when that, that uh, moisture comes in. I lived in Wisconsin for 20 years. I know how wet it gets. So mm -hmm. just something to keep in mind, okay? Okay, great. Thank you for that insight. Next question is, what, comp what capacity, pounds of hemp, can <laughs> your current decortication machine handle? What end products can it produce? The 660 will run up to a ton an hour, and we say up to a ton uh, because we don't know every genetic that's out there and what condition it's in. So if everything is set up right, for instance, we've been running it here and we've been hitting that, um, you know, 13%, 10% moisture, a uh, couple of people feeding it by hand. We have some in-feed conveyors that help speed that up. Ultimately, our bale and wine is modular and it will bolt up to the 660 and that will greatly improve the throughput and the quality. Um, fiber quality and herd quality, depending on the genetics. Uh, you gotta remember this, the, the CBD grown like a Christmas tree makes very, very poor fiber. Every node is a damage in the, in the strand. So, and it doesn't make very good herd either. Uh, people will love to think that that's the way to do it. It's just not, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so depending on the genetic that you grew and how you grew it, uh, you can have textile quality stuff all the way down to mulch. I mean, it just depends on what you got. Um, you know, we're, we're breaking uh, fiber down and we get between half and three inch long pieces of herd. Our fiber goal of this machine is long line fiber, long line meeting. You know, usually it's three inches and over, but if you feed a five foot long stock into this machine, it comes out in five foot pieces of fiber. The, and it's this first mill decorticating. People like to think that decortication means you're ready to make shirts and it's not even close to that. There's multiple steps that you have to do before you're ready to make uh, uh, filaments that you can make yard goods out of. I came out of packaging and have actually run for years knitting machines and non-woven machines and we have a pretty decent understanding of what it takes to make a strand that has a proper tinsel that you can make into a filament that you can run on a machine that makes yard goods. So and then our larger machines uh, they're going to run in the three to five ton range, which people think that's slow, but this machine is combing and carting the product. Now you've eliminated two more machine centers. So you can get away with a little lower to capacity, especially at the price point of these things. We're engineering them now, so we don't have a firm number. But if it's doing two steps and one pass, that's pretty interesting. Again, that machine's supposed to go into the cotton gin infrastructure if that's what you own. Otherwise, you, know, you, you can set it up however you want to configure it. That's the problem with hemp, 25,000 uses, and which one do you pick to make money at? <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. All right, thank you, Corbett. Moving on, um, I think we talked about this a little bit more, but um, can we hear or see more equipment specifics, especially the one pass seed, flower, and fiber <coughs> machine mentioned? Sure, we've got pictures of that. We had it at a show here in January before everything got shut down. Uh, we've had it ready for two years and we just can't ever get it into the field in time. When guys are starting to harvest, they wanna go. So it'll be in the field this year for sure. Um, but we've got some still images. If you gather their email address, we can sure send that out. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we can send that over to him. Excellent. 
Corbett's email as well. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, oh. Yeah, so any questions we don't get to today, feel this free email. to jot down this email address and send them to Corbett um, directly. We will answer every one of them. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, next one. Corbett, what kind of drying are you seeing as the most effective method? Uh, your scale is, is one of the main factors. If you're a 40 acre farm, then, you know, a, a smaller batch type drying machine is, is viable. Um, hang drying is still very viable. To me, once you get over 20 or 40 acres, hang drying becomes painful because of the labor and the space. Hang drying, like I said, takes 44,000 cubic feet per acre. So if you grow 10 acres, that's a pretty big space. Um, you know, I've seen those mesh belt dryers. I, I think the throughputs, again, it depends on your scale. Scale is everything. You've got to do that math on there to decide what equipment. If you're in the 100, 200 acre range, then it gets into y'all's machinery, which is great for doing that. It does a nice job. So those are some of the, the kind of avenues there. I'm not incredibly versed in every single drying technique. I like the, I've seen bulk barns, you know, the tobacco drying techniques. People are using those with success. Um, people that are in the, in the south that do peanuts already have drying equipment and they use that. Like I mentioned earlier in, in potato country where you are, uh, people are using the potato sellers to dry it. Just have to open the doors. Potato sellers meant to circulate humidity and the humidity is bad in hemp. Uh, onion people are putting it into their totes and drying it in their onion curing bins. Uh, California, where they have the plastic vegetable totes, how they harvest all the vegetables. Uh, we've done some, some batch drying stuff on, on with that existing technology too. So those are things we can visit about too. I would also mm -hmm. say it depends on what your end product is too. Mm -hmm. Say if you were going for say smokable flour and you reached out to IEC Thermo, I would say straight up, sorry, my dryer is not ideal for that. Um, just because, you know, that has its own process that it needs to, that smokable flower needs to follow. And our system isn't exactly conducive for something like that. So I definitely um, would argue that the end product also right. definitely plays a big factor. Up here in, I live in Washington State, and up here in Washington and Oregon last year, a lot of the farmers used hops dryers. Um, oh, and ultimately they were getting their product back decarbed. So that was telling them, hey, maybe this, pro this process works for hops, but it wasn't working for hemp, knowing that it was just mm. toasting their product. Too um, so I'd say scale and your desired end product definitely affect what processes, how you harvest, how you dry, how you extract. Um, right. Smokable stuff, that batch drying technique is, it would be much better that because it doesn't get agitated. It doesn't get moved or turned or tumbled, so you're not breaking that product down. Excellent, all right. Um, moving on, okay, so this is just, can you say the name, Corbett, again, of the machine to do separation? Oh, we, we call it our flower track. It's our uh, flower stem separation equipment, but we call it the flower track separation. It consists of a, uh, a tub grinder, which sounds bad, but when we set those tub grinders up, we're not actually grinding. We're, we're agitating the flour away from the stock and the stock comes out uh, whole out of the other end of our machine. And, and that, that's for a larger scale kind of process. Those are fed with you know skid steers or big, big front end loaders. Excellent, all right. Um, okay, out of your decorticator, what percentage of herd is left in the bast and what loss of bast is in the herd? Then does your processing train at the farm have the cleaners, combs, and handing units in them to get the fiber to roving, or do you bale after the decorticator and the first operation at the mill has to be primary cleaning? Same discussion on the herd side, which is easier to, which is easier to get fiber waste out than herd out of fiber. Can you see, that's a long question. Can you see it on your side, Corbett? Yep. Um, Perfect. We make those modulars so you can you can a la carte and get it as far as you want on your farm or not. Um, percentage wise, uh, this is a genetic question. We've run true fiber crops that were grown and harvested like a fiber crop and been in the high ni uh, mid to high 90s in separation. Now we're running a, a dual purpose crop here, grain and fiber crop at the moment, and we're between 86 and 92 percent clean depending on where you are in the bale and how it was redded. We've got some that was redded for two weeks, 
that you know were in the low 80s and some that was rated for four that's in the, the upper 80s, 90s. Um, when there's little small pieces of fiber left over in the herd, we've got another piece of equipment that we run that herd through. We put a conveyor underneath the 660, uh, move it up to that machine and we're knocking out Man, there's almost, if there's fiber left in the herd, it's, it's saliva type size. It's tiny hair fine. Uh, there's not much left in it. I was, we, we just did that this week and we're very, very happy with the results. So once we get that done a little bit more, we can publish something on that. Um, but those are kind of the, the ratios. And then, you know, what, what uh, I don't have anything at, at a farm type level that would make a roving and make filaments. Uh, you know, if, if you've been in a textile plant and seen a, a level wine package machine, I mean, the last one that I had uh, was 240 spools and it was a hundred and something feet long. And if you bought a new one, it would run you between four and six million dollars, depending on how fancy you got. That's a pretty expensive piece of machinery for a farm to own uh, just to make a few packages. So that's why we've chosen to use the existing uh, textile infrastructure. We're, you know, running these into gins using that downstream uh, uh, capital expenditure somebody's already done to, to make this more viable for people. So when we're decorticated, we're trying to break that fiber down so it can go into those pieces of machinery and, and help jumpstart this industry. I'm not saying you won't have a dedicated hemp plant at some point in time for textiles, but at the moment that might be a little bit of a stretch for people's capital expenditures knowing where we are today. Hopefully I answered all of those. That was a long question. <laughs> if you I did didn't great. email it to me and I'll answer it. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, moving on. What percentage of loss of product is there with these harvesters compared to a hand harvest? Uh, we've been almost even. Uh, we've, we've engineered them to be very, very gentle. Now, if you have a genetic that, like if you have a clean cut, and you put it on raised beds, you might miss between two and 3% of the buds that are down on those low branches. The clean strip machine, oh, we were in the mid to upper 90s of that. But you gotta remember we're harvesting at 12 acres an hour and saving between four and 5,000 bucks an acre. There is not a harvesting, mechanical harvesting technique for a crop out there that I'm aware of that can get 100% of any crop. It doesn't exist that I know of. So you're gonna give up some uh, crop that's sitting in the field for efficiency sake and for reduction in cost and labor and, and it's extra processes. So, but we it, see it's the same thing too, honestly, it's sort of, it's compromises, you know, it's picking your battles. Is it worth sending all of your equipment, all of your guys back through a field to grab that extra 2% of CBD or is the overhead to pay for all of that not worth the value of that 2% of CBD. So it really is kind of weighing your battles and picking and yeah. choosing what compromises you're willing to make. Three or four years ago, it might have made sense to send five, six people behind a harvester and pick those up. Today, you're stepping over a dollar to grab a dime. Doesn't make, it's not viable to me. So you'll have to do your own math, but there you go. Very true. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, um, next one. Are you designing your equipment assuming that feminized seed is on its way out? No, it'll harvest feminized crops too. Absolutely, it, okay. it'll do any of it. Um, but at it, it, today's price points, feminized seed, if the seed comes down in cost, then it'll still be viable. There's, there's, there's a reason to have it out there. You know, if you're a smaller niche market and you can afford that kind of uh, a seed investment in, in clones or transplants, however it is, there's still a viable market. That's going to be your, your better high-end smokable stuff and probably your higher-end, you know, organic uh, CBD crops. It's still very viable. I'm not saying that. But to do it at scale, then it's, it's got to come down to price. You can't pay a dollar a seed um, planted 100,000 plants an acre. We've got people around here planting 150,000 plants per acre. But their yield per acre of dry material and oil is higher than planting a thousand plants per acre with much, much less input cost. They'll yield 3,000 to 6,000 pounds of dry material an acre at six to eight percent. Interesting. All right. Thank you, Corbett. We'll end with this question. We, there were several we didn't get to. You guys ask such good questions, um, but the last one we'll answer today is 
Where is your manufacturing location for decorticators, comb, and carting equipment? We're in Monta Vista, Colorado, so made in the USA. All right. Everything That's is engineered, designed uh, from the back of the napkin all the way to the, the 3D drawings and out to the shop. <laughs> here. Now we do build, you know, I bring in some pieces from Canada, for instance, laser cut pieces from aluminum just because it, it's it's much, much cheaper up there. But most things are built right here. Great. All right. Thank you, Corbett. Um, all right. Again, if we did not get to answer your question, we just have run out of time, but feel free to shoot um, Corbett an email. He will be happy to answer them or have further conversations with you guys about harvesting. Um, and Corbett and Shauna, thank you guys so much for all this valuable information. I know I learned a lot about harvesting hemp today and I hope everyone else did too. Um, again, contact Corbett there. You can see his information on the slide and follow us on social media at IEC Thermo. Um, next week we will have Matthew Clark who is the CEO of Think Happy Consulting. He will join us to talk about workplace safety and health in cannabis and hemp, answering some very important questions <laughs> like why are legal cannabis and hemp workplaces complicated and why you need a workplace health and safety program in this industry. So be sure to join us. Again, we'll send you all a recording of this webinar. And thank you, Corbett and Shauna. And we hope to see you, everyone next week. Bye. Thanks, for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Corbett. Absolutely. Anytime. Have a good day, everyone.